12.50 p.m., September 13, 2006. A day like any other at Montreal General Hospital, part of the McGill University Health Center. The ER is swamped. 12.57 p.m., the phone rings in the ambulatory unit. Nurse Julie Robidoux takes the call. Hospital General. Bonjour, madame, c'est Urgence Santé. Oui. Écoutez, il y a présentement une fusillade au collège Dawson. On a une possibilité de plusieurs blessés. On aurait une confirmation présentement pour au moins trois blessés. OK. Et il y a une possibilité de cinq blessés. Donc là, juste au mot « fusillade euh, », je suis venue tout de suite la, la chair de poule, mais sans... Euh, je pense que je réalisais peut-être pas encore tout ce, tout ce qui s'en venait. Là. Right away, they began preparing for the first victims. With no time to lose, they had to clear the trauma ward. Then, empty the ambulatory unit. And finally, send as many patients as possible home or to other hospitals. It was a code orange, the hospital's highest state of alert. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dawson College was in a state of panic. Unlike at the École Polytechnique Massacre in 1989, paramedics arrived at the same time as the police. Their goal, saving the lives of the injured students as quickly as possible. C'était la panique, ça sortait de tous les côtés. Là. Le monde courait, ça sortait du, du collège, ça courait. Euh, il y en a qui s'en allaient vers l'est, il y en a qui s'en allaient vers l'ouest, c'était inimaginable. On nous a permis de rentrer. L'endroit n'était pas encore sécurisé, mais il euh, y avait des policiers armés à l'intérieur. Fait qu'on pouvait procéder si on voulait ou bien on pouvait rester dehors. Le taux de donnalite était très élevé. Et tout ce que je voulais, je voulais porter assistance aux gens qui en avaient besoin. A 22-year-old student, Leslie Markovsky, has just been shot twice in the head. The two paramedics immediately immobilized him using a cervical collar. There were two bullets uh, that got lodged uh, into my skull, uh, one of them in a frontal uh, bone flap uh, in the top part uh, of the brain. The other one uh, had either wrapped around or gone on from a stra some strange angle and lodged the base of the skull on the backside near the top of the spine. In the ambulance, there was no time to lose. First, a cardiac monitor. Next, oxygen. Leslie's pulse was weak. The meilleur moyen de tenter de sauver la vie, c'est de garder nos fonctions vitales, au moins la respiration, puis euh, une bonne circulation sanguine avec un bon pouls. C'est d'essayer de maintenir ça à, à un bon niveau, puis de se rendre le plus vite possible en salle de traumatologie où il va y avoir des soins appropriés. In 1903, Leslie Markovsky was the first patient to arrive at the trauma unit. An emergency medical team was ready and waiting for him. What's wrong? What's wrong? All right, give okay. me the IV, please. We have please. to come down. Start an IV, please. Come yeah. down, come down. Make sure you start an IV. Leslie was pale but conscious. He was even quite agitated. To calm him down, doctors administered a paralytic agent and an anesthetic and sedative. Here, here. Sorry. Quickly, please. Okay, we have a pulse rate of... Sat is 100, pulse rate is 104. And he's coming down. Okay, you're gonna get... They quickly applied what is called the ABC of traumatology. It's to ensure that the air passes, that the patient respires, that our patient has a pouls et euh, qu'il n'y a pas d'hémorragie externe là, non contrôlée. Meanwhile, other ambulances were arriving. Within minutes, two other trauma patients were admitted. 
OK, c'est quoi ton nom? Elisabeth. OK, Elisabeth, tout va aller vite. On va te déshabiller, puis le médecin va t'examiner, OK? Ah, où as-tu mal, Elisabeth? Mes bras, je sens plus mon bras de bras. Pas. OK, tu vas voir, ça va bien aller. OK, je vais t'examiner, je vais écouter tes poumons. OK, see if you can start IV. I don't know if I'm going to be able to start IV. and inserted IVs. The trauma unit looked like a military hospital. It was controlled chaos. Il y avait beaucoup de sang, euh, il y en avait par terre, là, on, les papiers, euh, les enveloppes de soluté, tout allait par terre. We didn't know how many we were going to get. We didn't know how bad it was or how many shooters there were for one thing. Get someone down straight away. Et je pense qu'à un moment donné, on était tous dans une situation où intérieurement, on se disait, je commence à m'essouffler, euh, combien d'autres qui vont arriver comme ça? Get someone down straight away. Je me souviens qu'à un moment donné, je me suis dit que ça pouvait pas être pire à la guerre, que ça devait être comme ça à la guerre. Guys, guys, shh. on a besoin de silence, OK? OK, George, what do you got? Guys. In charge of the troops was Dr. Bruno Bernardin. He was the trauma team leader that day. He quickly made a list of priorities. I'm going to take care of the whole department in general. I want to send it next to Moi, j'étais à la porte de la salle de réanimation. Les ambulances arrivent par le corridor juste à côté et ils venaient. Ils se présentaient à moi. Moi, ce que je faisais, c'est je demandais bon, où est-ce qu'ils sont les trous, où est-ce que le patient a été blessé. Je voyais quel est son état de conscience. Est-ce qu'il a de l'air très stable immédiatement. Leslie Markovsky was quickly intubated. Then he was put on a respirator. Ce patient-là a été rapidement envoyé au scanner pour avoir un scan de la tête pour voir les dommages. Est-ce que c'est des dommages qu'on juge irréversibles et il n'y a pas d'espoir, ou est-ce que c'est un dommage qui pourrait bénéficier d'une intervention du neurochirurgien pour aller nettoyer le dommage qui a été fait, enlever des caillots de sang, enlever les balles, redresser des fractures euh, au niveau du crâne? Dr. Tarek Razek, chief of trauma, examined Leslie's head x-rays. The first bullet grazed the skull above the right ear. It didn't enter the brain, fragmenting instead between the skin and the skull. The second bullet caused more damage. It fractured the skull, entered the brain, and hit the back of the cranium. The result, bullet and bone fragments scattered throughout the brain's right hemisphere. Looks pretty bad on Scott. Leslie's brain was reacting. He now suffered from an edema, a severe swelling. Dr. Rezek decided to send him to intensive care. Next, he sought a quick diagnosis from a neurosurgeon. So our initial response with him was, wow, that's, this looks very bad. So he was a very high level triage initially because he needed to be stabilized. He was, uh, uh, level of consciousness was very poor. His ability to maintain his breathing was very poor. Neurosurgeon Jeffrey Allen Hall got a call just as he was finishing an operation at the Montreal Neurological Hospital. He was informed that there had been a shooting at Dawson College. Leslie's x-rays were promptly sent to him electronically. He realized the young man's condition was serious. Well, as soon as I saw the images, it was clear, you know, that this was a very uh, severe traumatic brain injury and that he would require, uh, you know, uh, everything that we could do for him. Uh, it was clear to me that it was a surgical case uh, from, from that moment. On the Dawson College campus, a young student named Hader Kadim was fighting for his life. J'ai eu trois balles. J'ai eu une dans le derrière de la tête. J'ai eu une dans le derrière du cou. 
et j'ai eu une dans ma jambe gauche. Donc, toutes les euh, trois balles étaient dans mon côté gauche. J'ai pas senti les balles, j'ai juste senti celle à ma tête. Donc, c'est comme si quelqu'un euh, m'a frappé avec un bat de baseball vraiment fort à la tête. OK, bouge pas, OK? Reste comme ça, je vais m'occuper toi. Un police officer, Pierre-Marc Houle, took note of his injuries. Tu peux s'en la tête? Tu peux juste regarder ça un petit peu, touche pas à ta tête. His first act was stanching the bleeding from his head. Unité 12. Je vais demander euh... assistance aux gens de santé immédiatement pour un homme d'environ 18 ans avec blessure et segment à la tête. Quand le policier m'a dit que j'ai été tiré dans la tête, c'est là où je comprenais que je pouvais, euh, ma vie pouvait finir n'importe quand, d'une seconde à l'autre. Donc, euh, j'ai euh, tout de suite pris ma chaîne, qui dit euh, Dieu en arabe. Donc, euh, je l'ai tenu fort, puis euh, j'ai commencé à faire mes prières. Paramedics took over from the police officer. But the area was not secured, and they risked their lives. Okay, est-ce que tu as été tiré à l'extérieur ou à l'intérieur? En avant. En avant du collège, est-ce que tu es blessé ailleurs? Trois mois coraniens, hein? Il faut évacuer L'important, c'est de ne pas bouger ta tête, OK? C'est lorsque le policier nous a dit qu'on ne pouvait pas immobiliser sur place, qu'il fallait évacuer rapidement parce que ça tirait encore. Alors, je me suis dit, si que lui a deux balles dans la tête puis dans le mollet, est-ce que je suis la prochaine cible? Fait que, à ce moment-là, j'ai comme un peu comme vu que ça se pouvait, que ça serait mes derniers moments de vie à moi aussi. Tu vas nous aider, OK? Tu juste enlever sur ta jambe. Go. OK. J'ai aucun moyen de me protéger. Mon travail fait en sorte que je peux faire la différence entre la vie et la mort de cet individu-là que lui est déjà atteint. Je ne peux pas l'abandonner. On va t'aider, on va te donner des soins à la Mais bouge pas ta tête. Reste comme on a pu essayer de tenir la tête le plus possible pour pouvoir l'installer sur la civière. L'embarquer dans l'ambulance et immédiatement il donnait de l'oxygène euh, puis euh, le collet cervical qu'on appelle pour protéger la colonne, étant donné qu'il y avait deux balles aussi euh, au niveau de la tête. Max, un, deux, trois, parfait, excellent. Avec euh, l'installation de la plante. If Hader were to be saved, time was of the essence. Leslie Markovsky lay in the ICU, his life hanging by a thread. His condition posed a dilemma. During a code orange, priority is always given to patients with the best chance of being saved. But Leslie's chances of survival were slim. Regardless, they would attempt the impossible. Neurosurgeon Jeffrey Allen Hall prepared to meet Leslie Markovsky in the OR. He knew it was a life or death procedure. Let's uh, check, we're ready to uh, begin. Meanwhile, the, the medical team prepped Leslie for surgery. His blood pressure was now a crucial factor. His brain was reacting to the bullets and the inflow of blood was causing major swelling. He's bleeding a little bit, Michel. I'll keep the blood pressure as it is. It's very good for the brain. I'm going to connect the manitol. The anesthesiologist's job was to maintain cardiovascular stability throughout the operation. The conditions uh, of uh, Leslie Markovsky were um, very uh, precarious when he came. So. The task is to keep the perfusion of the brain at its best in order to ensure that the oxygen and the glucose and other nutrients and electrolytes go to the brain, especially to the areas that are in danger. Okay, it's well sterilized and now we should uh out our incision. Dr. Hall plotted out the exact portion of the skull to be cut open. The edema was so severe that he had to remove half of Leslie's skull so his brain would not be crushed under the pressure. Later. 
first, Dr. Hall removed the fragments of the first bullet that were located outside the cranium. Then, one by one, he gingerly removed the bone and bullet fragments. The goal was not to damage the cortex. For the second bullet, it was a risky operation. I was preoccupied, you know, by the by the bullet uh, fragment that was there uh, at a, a confluence of uh, veins, which we call the torcula heterophi, and uh, deciding, you know, what what should be done uh, about that uh, fragment was clearly what what was preoccupied me at that time. If Dr. Hall were to pierce the vein, Leslie would die. As a result, he decided not to remove the second bullet. Can I have a graph, please? The final stage in the operation, replacing the brain membrane with another sterile one. Surprisingly, he used a cow pericardium, the membrane surrounding the animal's heart. Can you suction here so I can see where best is? Thank you. Dr. Hall Good. then closed the wound. In the meantime, the large piece of skull was put in a freezer. Leslie would live with an exposed brain, missing the other half of his cranium for seven weeks. So what we actually did was remove a very large uh, part of the, the bone in, in a procedure called a hemicraniectomy uh, to allow brain swelling to occur to take pressure off the normal surrounding uh, tissue. Leslie was now in critical condition in the ICU. His condition was complicated by pneumonia and several seizures. Did he get uh, dilantin loaded in emergency? Uh, yeah, he was loaded. Okay, perfect. So um, let's uh, increase his... Dr. Ash Rezaini, director of critical care, had one goal, reducing his cerebral edema. Uh, and then there's medical therapy that we do to try and decrease the swelling. There's medication that we give that tries to decrease the, the fluid in the brain and decrease the swelling. Uh, the way we ventilate the patient, uh, we keep the carbon dioxide level a little lower than normal, and that decreases a little bit of blood flow to the brain, which then decreases the pressure in the brain. Leslie Markovsky was kept in an induced coma for three weeks to reduce his edema. I had a lot of crazy dreams while I was asleep. And of course, like when you're asleep and you're dreaming, you don't know that it's a dream. You think you're really in the situation, like any movie or television show, and now all of a sudden you're the main character. But obviously I couldn't distinguish that. So when I did technically wake up, I mean, I didn't know that I was awake or just not in a, another quirky dream. I mean, after all the dreams I'd had, being in a hospital was not so far out. He would eventually recover with no major after effects, but he faced a long and strenuous convalescence. A half hour after the shooting began, Hader Kadim arrived at the hospital. He was part of the second wave of four victims. Dr. Ann Hurdle immediately attended to Hader. He was still conscious despite having been shot three times, including once in the head. Tachycardia, or rapid heart rate, was detected. Next, his awareness level was measured. But 10 minutes after he arrived, Hader had a seizure. He was administered dilantin, an anticonvulsant. So we may need to intubate. Okay. All right. Sucks is going in. The team made sure his breathing passages were clear, then intubated him. 
but he quickly uh, had a seizure and uh, became unresponsive and was actively seizing. This obviously uh, was an indication there was a potentially severe intracranial injury that was progressing. Um, and so that was very, very worrisome at that moment. Hater required further tests. First, he was given a blood test, then some brain scans. The first bullet hit Hader Kadim in the head, in the left occipital lobe. The bullet fractured his skull and fragmented slightly, but didn't enter his brain. The second bullet lodged deep in the left side of the back of his neck, narrowly missing his spine. Based on the results, Dr. Grisaini made a decision. They would not operate on Hader. His body would eventually shed the fragments of the first bullet. The bullet in his neck was deemed too close to the spine to be removed. However, results from the blood test showed a very high level of lactic acid, an indication that Hader's metabolism was in shock. When we see an acid level in the blood, it's called the lactic acid, when we see that elevated, it means in this context of a, of a trauma like this, that there's not enough oxygen and blood flow going to the organs. Without another wound, there was no real explanation for why he would deteriorate this way. And so that was extremely concerning, A, that we had missed something, which is, you know, very conceivable in the crush of num numerous patients coming through. So my biggest fear at that moment was we had missed a penetrating wound. To make absolutely sure, the doctors decided to send Hader back for a full abdominal scan. The results? No other wound. Hader Kadim was sent to the ICU. But his wounds were still causing damage. He had a second seizure. His blood pressure rose to 206 over 110. Drugs to control his blood pressure and seizures were administered to him. At that moment, Hader was fighting for his life. Meanwhile, Dawson College was engulfed in panic and confusion. It was suspected there might be other shooters. Risking their lives, paramedics looked for other victims. A young student, Jessica Albert, had been hiding in an office for nearly 40 minutes. She had been shot in the abdomen. Je me suis assise sur une chaise, puis je savais pas vraiment si je, comment j'étais touchée. Fait que quand j'ai mis ma main sur mon ventre, puis c'est là que j'ai vu qu'il y avait un trou. C'est là que je me suis rendu compte que j'avais bien et bien été touchée. Qu'est-ce qui était atroce, c'est qu'on était juste à côté de l'atrium. Fait qu'on entendait le monde crier, on entendait les, les coups de fusil, c'était c'était l'enfer, c'était lourd. Puis le monde, il pouvait pas rien faire. Puis nous, moi non plus, je pouvais pas rien faire. On, on voulait juste attendre que, que quelque chose arrive. Dr. Nguyen from Emergency Medical Services, accompanied by a paramedic, eventually found Jessica. He had to act fast. Jessica was in bad shape. Moi, quand je vois son corps, je pense en tout, je sentais pas le pouls. C'est grave. Je panne pour le ventre, il est dur. Je dois sortir cette fille là. Sinon, dans cinq minutes, elle sera morte ici. With no stretchers in the middle of a college under siege, Dr. Nguyen evacuated Jessica on an office chair. Ça me touche énormément la violence. Euh, quand j'ai vu Jessica, je pensais, je dois la sauver. Je pensais comme elle, c'est ma fille. 
je dois la sauver, absolument. On est arrivé sur la chaise, on l'a pris de la chaise, on l'a installé sur la civière, puis c'est au plus vite à l'hôpital. Puis même le médecin nous disait qu'elle passerait pas, qu'elle en haut de la côte, elle serait sans doute morte. Donne-moi ça, OK. Once in the ambulance, Jessica was stabilized. On l'a transféré sur notre civière, on a installé l'oxygène, puis par la suite, elle est partie à l'hôpital. Ça a été quand même assez rapide. Elle était très calme. C'est ce qui m'a marqué le plus. Elle, elle était extrêmement calme, relaxe, puis elle passait son temps à nous remercier, à nous dire merci, merci. One forty-three p.m. Jessica Albert was part of the third wave of victims. She was still conscious when admitted to the trauma unit. Emergency doctor Anne Hurdle and the nurses quickly evaluated her. Dr. Hurdle realized her wound was very serious. She was given an ultrasound to see the extent of the damage to her abdomen. Chez Jessica, c'était positif pour beaucoup de sang. Donc à ce moment-là, ça tout va très vite, encore plus vite, parce que ces patients-là peuvent décompenser très rapidement. And I need some o negative, please. Okay, Carolyn, we need some o negative. We have a positive fast okay, here. Jessica, il va falloir que tu ailles en salle d'opération. Ok. Je veux juste s'assurer que tout est correct dans ton ventre. Ok. Mais non, tu vas pas mourir. Ok, on s'occupe de toi. Ok. On veut juste être certain que tout est correct. Ok. Elle s'est venue me chercher. Je me disais, t'es tellement jeune, elle se, fait, elle se fait tirer dessus. Et puis, euh, je me suis j'avais juste eu envie de la prendre dans mes bras et de dire, ben non, ma cocotte, tu vas pas mourir, on s'occupe bien de toi. Euh, mais en sachant que son état était très sérieux. Jessica was immediately sent to the operating room. Meanwhile, Hader Kadim was still in the ICU. The medical team was still concerned about his lactic acid level. But the results of his latest blood test were encouraging. His lactic acid level had returned to normal. Those blood tests were repeated, and that lactic acid came down relatively quickly, now reassuring us that it must have been from the seizure or some blood loss at the scene, but nothing profound, and that we're not missing something. Um, and that hopefully the reason now he's unconscious is because of the seizure and not because of damage from the bullet wound. A few hours after his medication was stopped, Hayter suddenly woke up. He thought the shooting was still going on. It's at the Hospital General of Montreal, it's at the intensive. I'm just going to do a test neurologic, okay? The nurse tested his reflexes. His reaction was normal. Hader was finally out of danger. The biggest advantage of our victims from the Dawson event was that they were young, and uh, they were young brains in particular. And young brains are quite resilient. And uh, it shows that it's worth going the extra mile. It's uh, even when we think that the chances are small, um, the chances are small, but the chance for recovery is there, especially with young brains. In the elevator, taking Jessica Albert to the OR, her condition worsened. Good air entry bilaterally. Her temperature was plummeting and her pulse non-existent. Okay. Surgeon Kozar Kwaja was assigned to operate on Jessica. What room are we going to? in the hallway. As he met Jessica at the elevator, she was on the verge of passing out. Right away in OR A. I 
actually uh, saw her coming out of the elevators. And my first image of her was, uh, was very uh, impressing. I, she, the young girl, uh, she, she looks very young and she was completely white as a ghost. Um, and uh, we, we rushed her into the operating room, into this operating room. Jessica's vital organs had been badly damaged. The bullet first entered through her sternum and grazed her heart. It then traveled through her liver, stomach, pancreas and spleen before exiting through her back. Anesthesiologist Juana Senho had to prep her quickly for the operation. He realized that her body temperature and blood pressure were critical. Dr. Senho's challenge was to maintain her body temperature. When body temperature fall, you decrease the performance of the heart, you decrease all the enzymes involved in the coagulation cascade, so the patients tend to bleed more. Then you have arrhythmias, then you have problem, problems with the kidneys and with the gut. So keeping the temperature is a primary goal. Okay, we're opening. As soon as the operation began, Dr. Kwaja noticed several hemorrhaging. Okay, there's lots of bleeding here, packing, I need lots of packing. Blood transfusions would be crucial for stabilizing Jessica. Okay, listen, let's pack all four quadrants. As soon as we opened up the abdomen, there was a lot of blood. Uh, it was, uh, again, it was very um, um, impressive. We need more packs. Dr. Kwaja used gauze to stanch her liver hemorrhage. Can we have some meds, please? Meds? He discovered that her spleen was too damaged. He decided to remove it. Okay, spleen is coming out. Okay, spleen is out. The liver? Okay, so we're gonna have to quickly close the stomach hole because it's... Uh... Her stomach was also perforated. Dr. Kwaja closed it temporarily with stitches. So one of our, our main goals in this type of operation is to minimize, to stop the bleeding and to try to minimize the amount of spoilage that is happening from intestine that may have been opened. So my goal at that point was to minimize and to stop the bleeding as best as I could. Her pancreas had a large collection of blood, a hematoma, meaning the aorta may have been hit. The aorta needed to be scrupulously examined. Luckily, it hadn't been hit. It was very important to us to see whether or not the bullet had touched the heart because it was in the same, it was very close to the heart. So we opened the sac that contains the heart to see if there was any blood there. Um, and when we opened the area of the heart, we saw that there was no blood. So luckily, the bullet had just grazed underneath that sac. So she had just missed her heart. Uh, and so there was a little bit of a relief uh, at that point. So, uh, the rate, uh, but then Dr. Kwaja and Dr. Christian Sirois discovered that her diaphragm had been hit. Jessica risked a collapsed lung or pneumothorax. Scissors, please. The surgeon decided to insert a drain. Dr. Kwaja, the blood pressure drop and heart rate came up. Since the temperature is coming down too, it probably would be nice to uh, stop at some point to re-stabilize the patient and bring her back to ICU. But the team was worried. Jessica's blood pressure and temperature were plummeting. Yep, we have to pack. Quickly go to the ICU and uh, we'll try to rewarm her there in the ICU. Perfect. And during this time, while we were doing this, she became very unstable, so she had sort of gotten a little bit better in the operating room as the anesthetist was giving blood, but then she lost her blood pressure. We actually were very concerned that she was gonna die at that point. So a decision was made, well, let's stop here, warm her up, give her the appropriate fluids, bring her to a new situation, and then we come back with her more stable, and we finish doing the job. Okay, everyone, we're gonna keep the, the, the abdomen open. Let's just pack and we're gonna go straight to the ICU. I need uh, two JP drains, a uh, green towel, and I need a vidrape because there's a lot of spillage. The surgical here. team decided to halt the first operation. After inserting drains in Jessica's liver and pancreas, they returned her immediately to the ICU 
without closing her wound. Warm the patient up. At this point, I, I felt that we had stopped the major bleeding, uh, so we left her abdomen actually open. Uh, even taking the time to close the abdomen would be uh, too much time. Uh, the next few hours were extremely critical. Four p.m. Jessica was in critical condition in the ICU. Her nurse, Caroline Hardy, wrapped her in warming blankets to raise her body temperature. Jessica, already intubated and with an arterial line, was put on a respirator. From that point on, her parents never left her bedside. I never seen so many films, so many television, so many monitors, so many machines that worked to maintain her life. And it's your child. It doesn't explain it. Ce qu'on a vécu, euh, je m'excuse, à ce moment-là. In an attempt to raise Jessica's blood pressure, doctors gave her several transfusions as well as medication. But the main risk was that the open wound would become infected. Dr. Kwaja informed her mother. Son abdomen était resté ouvert. Que... Peut-être le lendemain ou le surlendemain, il pourrait réopérer puis refermer. Euh, mais là, c'était trop enflé, il pouvait pas. Euh... Puis là, il nous disait qu'il pouvait pas se prononcer sur rien avant 72 heures. If the critical care team managed to stabilize Jessica, she would undergo a second operation. Meanwhile, her life hung by a thread. Jessica Albert spent a rough night in the ICU. But the next day, Jessica's vital signs stabilized. She could go back to the OR. All right, let's connect the bulb suctions, okay. please. Excellent. Okay. Uh, During the second please. operation, Dr. Kwaja first examined the laceration on her diaphragm. These, uh, sutures. Her lung had, in fact, collapsed, so he repaired her diaphragm. He also put permanent stitches in her stomach. Then he inserted new drains into her pancreas and liver. Okay. This coming together very nicely. Dr. Kwaja finally managed to close up Jessica's abdomen. Back in the ICU, Jessica was now in stable condition. But the first days would be grueling for her. Elle essayait d'écrire un petit peu des petits mots, était sous l'effet des drogues très fortes, mais euh, elle faisait des petits signes de tête là, quand elle était réveillée. On, on voyait qu'elle revenait. C'était rassurant, à quelque part, elle était là. là mais quand ça commençait à aller plus mal le lendemain, puis là, il parle de remettre euh, le respirateur, puis ça, c'est très, très dur. Là. Où tu dis, elle va pas être revenue pour repartir, là, c'est pas vrai, là. Ça a été beaucoup des grosses montagnes russes, là, les premiers jours. Okay. Attends. Jessica had to battle complications from her asthma and lung secretions. So the asthma became a little bit of a problem. And she was quite wheezy. And, and this just contributed to the difficulty with the breathing. We actually had to put her, put the tube back, help her breathe for several more days, treat her asthma a little better, get her pain better controlled, clear some more fluid from the lungs, and then we were able to get her off a ventilator. After 10 long and grueling days in the ICU, Jessica was finally out of danger. Jessica Albert, Hader Kadim, 
and Leslie Markovsky were among the most serious cases treated that day. Most of the eight other victims had been wounded in the arms or legs. That day, the medical profession showed itself capable of dealing with a major incident. The entire team really uh, felt that they had done a good job. And it was extreme, it gave all of us a great sense of pride in the people around us. I think it was people applauding for the person next to them. That way to go, you know, that was, uh, this, ha this happened, that's one thing. At least we were able to do what we're supposed to do, and, and it was done well. Get uh, Dilantin loaded in emergency. And on a very personal note, it was very moving. Uh, we did very well. Uh, this was a great success. We were, for the ICU, six for six. The six that came to us have all left, all done well, all gone home. Um, that's a success story. Uh, but we were very lucky. Luck did, in fact, play a part. The shooting took place at lunchtime when a full medical staff was on duty and at a college located less than five minutes from the trauma unit. Today, the victims want to pay tribute to the medical team that saved their lives. I mean, at the time, I didn't know what had happened, but uh, now that I'm aware of everything, it's obvious I wouldn't be talking to you today if not for him. You know, thanks to uh, modern science, I'm the same person as I was a year ago. Les médecins ont fait un bon travail. Ils ont bien euh, fonctionné, puis je suis vraiment reconnaissant à, au uh, Centre de Traumatologie. Jessica Albert was overwhelmed by the dedication of her surgeon, Dr. Kwaja. Il n'y a pas de mots pour décrire ce qu'elle fait. C'est vraiment une très bonne personne. Je suis vraiment contente. The day's triumph was marked by a few failures. En dedans de quelques minutes, toutes les lignes téléphoniques de l'hôpital ont été sursaturées. C'était impossible d'obtenir une ligne vers l'extérieur à partir de l'intérieur. Donc, les infirmières euh, qui essayaient d'appeler du personnel infirmier en renfort n'étaient pas capables. La secrétaire a dû prendre son propre porte-monnaie, aller au téléphone public et commencer à signaler avec ça, ou son cellulaire, sortir de l'hôpital juste en face et commencer à téléphoner aussi. There are certain things that, yes, we wish we had done more. We wish we had more staff that uh, we could have done the charting properly. We wish we had more staff that everything would have been prepared and ready. In a code orange, staff members are immediately required to open these boxes containing medical equipment tailored to deal with this type of crisis. This was not done. If we'd have been warned to, we would have been able to use our code orange box, which uh, we never opened, and that would have helped tremendously because it already has the charts and all the requisitions that we need for this kind of, this kind of trauma. That day, medical staff treated 20 wounded in total, including nine transferred to other hospitals. But would the medical system be able to handle an incident involving more victims? Si arrivait un plus gros désastre, on aurait de la difficulté. On n'est pas exactement prêt. Je pense les mesures d'urgence, que ce soit au niveau de l'hôpital, de l'institution, que ce soit au niveau de la ville, malheureusement, seraient rapidement débordées. Il, serait, il se ferait à ce moment-là ce qu'on appelle un triage naturel, c'est-à-dire ceux qui sont capables d'arriver vivants arriveraient vivants. Les autres, ça serait plus un coup de chance. Several members of the medical team and emergency medical services went through some intense experiences that day. Experiences they would never forget. 
l'oxygène. Moi, j'ai vécu un choc post-traumatique suite à Dawson. J'ai eu à consulter. J'avais des flashbacks. Je faisais souvent des cauchemars. Je dormais plus, je mangeais plus. J'étais rendu. C'est très difficile. C'est là après qui est difficile quand on repense à ça. Fais ça dans l'ambulance. Avec ta bonne jambe, tu vas nous aider. OK? Fais juste te lever sur ta jambe. Mais cette intervention-là, quand ma vie, celle de mon collègue, était en jeu, parce qu'on s'est retrouvés comme dans la ligne, ça a été un moment très difficile. Puis que par la suite, je me suis remis en question aussi un peu au début, à savoir, tu sais, je trouvais-tu encore ça? J'ai trouvé ça dur par la suite. There's a lot of blood. We need more packs. During that day, um, it crossed all of our minds. You know, what if our family member was at that uh, school at that time? And my wife could have easily have been there during that time. She was going to the school while she was pregnant, and it uh, it actually uh, it affects all of us uh, on a personal level. <laughs> For months, Hader Kadim has been channeling his rage and his love of life into his music. This song is about the events of September 13, 2006. Almost a year after the shooting, Hader met Jessica Albert and Leslie Markovsky for the first time. J'avais le but de partager avec les autres survivants pour qu'ils puissent comme pour qu'ils puissent avoir leur propre façon de de se mettre dans la chanson, mais en même temps ils 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 laissent un peu aller de leur colère à cause de l'événement et tout ça. Today, Hader Kadim, Jessica Albert, and Leslie Markovsky have recovered from their injuries. They are now focused on the future. Ça montre vraiment que le tireur n'a pas accompli ce qu'il voulait faire, n'a pas pris. Notre vie nous a donné une per perspective euh, différente là-dessus, mais quand même, on, on est capable euh, d'aller euh, plus loin. De, de continuer notre vie, puis d'aller réaliser nos rêves, nos, nos objectifs qu'on s'avait mis avant que ça arrive, de ne pas laisser cet événement-là les détruire, de continuer à faire qu -ce, que, qu ce que vraiment qu on veut être, qu'est-ce qu'on veut devenir. Puis je pense pas qu'il va avoir réussi qu ce qu'il qu qu voulait faire. C'est notre façon de dire qu'il ne nous a pas affectés du tout. Puis en plus, il nous a même changé positivement. Ça, so, c'est notre façon de gagner.